Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Uh, I'm Ken Peacock. I'm a prof in the Department of Philosophy here. Uh, and I'm going to be very brief because my main job is to introduce Professor Susan Dielman, who will in turn introduce this evening's priestly lecturer, Professor Agnes Tam of the University of Calgary. So this lecture series was endowed in the name of Professor F.E.L. Priestley. F.E.L. stands for Francis Ethelbert Lewis. And I mean, they just don't make names like they used to. Right? <laughs> who taught English at the University of Toronto and who had strong roots in southern Alberta. The terms of reference of the endowment state that the, lecture, the lectures should, quote, further the tradition of humane letters so strongly advanced in the works of Professor Priestley. Both Professor Dielman and Professor Tam are young scholars who are direct, already making significant contributions to that long tradition, which needs all the support and defense it can get in our present so very perilous times. Professor Dielman is the newest permanent member of our Department of Philosophy. She's one of five Canada-wide endowed Jaroslavsky chairs in trust and political leadership, which exist due to the vision and generosity of entrepreneur Stephen Jaroslavsky. The University of Lethbridge is among the five Canadian sites picked to host a Jaroslavsky chair, according to Mr. Jaroslavsky, because of its emphasis on liberal education and its interdisciplinary humanistic approach. So it's my pleasure now to turn the podium over to Professor Susan Dillon. Thank you, Dr. Peacock, Oki, and welcome to the University of Lethbridge. Our university's Blackfoot name is Iniskip, meaning sacred buffalo stone. We, as people living and benefiting from Blackfoot Confederacy ter traditional territory, honor the traditions of people who have cared for this land since time immemorial. We recognize the diverse population of indigenous peoples who, have, who attend the University of Lethbridge, and the contributions these indigenous peoples have made in shaping and strengthening the university community in the past, present, and in the future. So thank you for joining us this evening. It's my honor and my absolute pleasure to be able to introduce um, both our priestly speaker and the keynote speaker for our philosophy undergraduate conference, which occurred earlier today. The students who presented their work are here. Um, I'm sure if you wanted to ask them about their papers, they'd be happy to chat with you at some point. But I'm here at this moment to introduce the keynote speaker and priestly speaker, Dr. Agnes Tam. Dr. Tam completed a Master's of Science in Political Theory at the London School of Economics and Political Science and a PhD in Philosophy from Queen's University. She is a trained lawyer who has worked as a legal advocate worked at the Social Justice Center at Concordia University and the Research Group on Constitutional Studies at McGill University in Montreal. She currently is an Assistant Professor of Philosophy at the University of Calgary, where she's also an Applied Ethics Fellow with the Calgary Institute for the Humanities. Dr. Tam's research and teaching focus on moral and political philosophy, asking and providing answers to questions like, what role do stories play in democratic societies? How can we best foster trustworthiness in society? What does moral progress look like and how is it possible? I think these are some of the issues and topics that she'll be exploring in her talk tonight toward an ethics of belonging. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Agnes Tan. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Dillman and Professor Peacock uh, for the introduction and, and giving me this honored opportunity and this prestigious platform to speak on a topic that is, I think, um, resonate with a lot of us um, in Canada, um, both as immigrants or even just a member of Canadian society. So I thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, okay, I don't think I need to do too much to convince you that there is a crisis of belonging, but I'll just um, highlight it 
for our focus tonight. What exactly is this crisis of belonging that I'm talking about and why does it matter to you and to me as citizens of Canada or the global uh, society? Um, you may think that, well, it's not only now that we are living through the age of migration, uh, the world has always experienced different waves of migration. So what is so unique about this moment in time? Um, I think that is right. You might think that there is a heightened wave of migration because of ver various uh, crises, wars and refugee crises. Well, that might be it. But I think what is so special and puzzling about the current crisis of belonging is that it's not just immigrants or refugees or national minorities who feel alienated and displays in, in the political communities. What is special about the current wave of uh, 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 belonging crisis is that even members of the majoritarian population claim or allege or report to be feeling estranged. So, so that, that is a core puzzle for tonight. And then why does it matter? Well, I, you may think that of course it matters because it, it hurts, uh, it pains us to be alienated, it hurts to be lonely, and a lot of us have that experience. But I am not a psychologist or psychiatrist, so I will not be able to speak on that deeply and meaningfully. I'm a political philosopher, so my focus tonight would be on the threat of this ongoing crisis belonging to the health and the stability of liberal democracy. What do I mean by that? So just some highlight, uh, 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 head, uh, headlines uh, from newspapers uh, that I pulled out. So you can see that there is this uh, extremist far-right uh, parties uh, rising in the popularity in Germany and across Europe. So the AFD is winning a lot of seats in a lot of local elections. And it's not just in Germany, while well, Italy um, um, elected uh, 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 an, uh, an, an anti-immigrant, some may argue, uh, anti-refugee uh, 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 president. And it's happening in Sweden too. Sweden has always been the, uh, the, the ideal of a strong welfare state, live with democratic society, but even now the ruling party, uh, uh, the government, is sort of on the right. And you don't need more examples, but Netherlands is another reason one. And you might be thinking like, okay, you're just talking about Europe, what about Canada, we are fine, no? Uh, so, so this is not just a matter of rhetoric or exaggeration. Um, just uh, in February, during a QA, and uh, a the conservative leader, uh, Pierre Polyev, uh, said this. Well, you know, when people stop me on the streets, they tell me they don't recognize the country, they feel like strangers in their own country with how horribly things have changed. Now, I don't know your personal opinions uh, 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 on, on him or on the Conservative Party, but I do think that uh, there is some degree of truth to this statement about the national sentiment. And this itself should um, worry us because if the belonging is misplaced or if the crisis of belonging is not addressed in the right way or adequate way, Canada cannot be too complacent of our welcoming multicultural society. So that is the problem that I want to work with together tonight. So what are the, some of the solutions? What have political philosophers have proposed and, and do these solutions work? This is a quick overview of the four solutions that we'll look at. Um, the first one is to say, well, eh, we don't have to care about this crisis of belonging, really. Well, at least not directly. We are just strangers who care about belonging. And so long as everyone, everyone, immigrant, minority, majority, are guaranteed basic freedoms, we'll be in a fine society. Uh, the second solution, not from libertarian, but from other liberals, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about these labels later, you don't have to care about them right now, is to say, well, maybe we are not strangers. We, as citizens, we are members. So what a society, healthy society need in this time is to enforce an ethics of inclusion. You probably have heard about the idea of inclusion. Okay, so that is a core ideal in a liberal society, still. 
We don't have to address belonging directly. The third solution takes seriously the ideal or the ethics of belonging and, 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 and this particular tradition called the civic republicanism believes that belonging at, or the source of it is from the social contract. So ethical belonging requires drawing up this social contract justly. And we'll look at that. And I also don't believe this is the right solution. And, and finally, I'll propose to you my own solution to this crisis of belonging, which requires taking belonging seriously. And I argue that what belonging really is, is this bond of history that we share as citizens. And in order to keep this bond in good form, we need an ethics of narration. And at this point, you're like, why do I have to go through all the wrong answers if you think they're wrong answer to arrive at your answer? Why don't you just focus on your own answer? Um, this is how I, I see it. Um, I think there is a lot to be learned from past and wrong answers. Uh, that's why I, I take history of intellectual ideas or just history of humanity seriously because I think we can only learn from our past mistakes. And I think, I forgot who said this, the, the expert is not who know the right answer. The expert is, to know, is one who knows all the wrong answers. And if I know some of them, I'm pretty happy already. So, there we go. Uh, so the first solution that I want to look at tonight is the one proposed by many libertarians. Libertarians are the labels that we give to political philosophers uh, or theorists who, who believe that individual freedom is the most important ideal for a just society. And to them, when confronted with this global crisis belonging, it's to suppress it because belonging is a very dangerous sentiment. And the best society that we should live in is one of land of freedom and just acknowledge one another as strangers, but we respect one another's freedom as strangers. Okay, let's take a closer look at this. So um, the argument for thinking that belonging is a dangerous sentiment is largely historical. Uh, especially if you look at the history of nation building in the 19th century, belonging fuel the worst um, catastrophes in human histories. It led to racial exclusion, ethnic cleansing, and genocide. And it is because in modern society, Society is open and there is diversity. We belong to different ethnicity, different races, different cultures. We believe different religions. And there, there's no single thing that unites us together. And if you want to um, enforce or cultivate a sense of belonging on the national level, a lot of libertarians believe that it's ultimately sinophobic and exclusionary. So under the condition of diversity and conflict in modern society, belonging is very dangerous. It should never be enforced, at least on the state level. Well, you can try to seek your sense of belonging in your private sphere, find the, someone that you belong to in your romantic relationship, in your family, or if you don't, you can't, can't do it. It's not the state's business to help you, and it definitely is not state's business to enforce national sense of belonging. So that's the libertarian position. And I got a quote from a libertarian uh, who happened to be my supervisor from my postdoc at McGill, uh, Jacob Levy, and he says this. I begin with what I take to be a moral truth. The inhabitants of a political community are more like strangers who find themselves locked in a very large room together than they are like an extended family or a voluntary association united in pursuit of a common purpose. They are not, what nationalists falsely claim co-nationals to be, members of some pre- or extra-political social whole that can make its will felt through politics, some social soul that wears the state as a body. So Levy is basically saying, okay, wake up, there is, we are just strange, let's face it, that's the reality. Let's not imagine that we are members of any communities or family. No, no. So, so that, 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 that's the, the conclusion. Ethics of belonging is dangerous. We don't need an ethics of belonging. What we need is an ethics 
of strangership. So what is this ethics of strangership? Well, basic uh, you, uh, freedom, a, a universal basic human rights, such as, well, if you have immigrants, if you have refugees, let's guarantee that they, regardless of their, their backgrounds, their religions, their cultural uh, affinities, right to settle, right to exit, freedom from torture, those basic freedoms. And if everyone is guaranteed a basic set of freedoms, that's not too bad. What do you think of the solution? You'll like it. <laughs> Let me try to convince you some limits of this. Well, Simon Weil says this, uh, a philosopher, uh, to be rooted is perhaps the most important and least recognized need of the human soul. I am not so sure whether this land of freedom, this stranger land of freedom is so habitable for social being like us who just have a deep need to belong. But you're like, wait, wait, wait. The libertarian just said that it's not that you cannot seek belonging. It's just that you cannot seek belonging on the national state level because it's dangerous. You can find some, your soulmate wherever you want, but not in the state on the state level. But so here are two other um, uh, quotes that I want to share with you to make you think that maybe national belonging is also a need for many of us. So. Um, uh, uh, a sociologist, Robert Brubaker, uh, says this, after reviewing uh, recent histories uh, across the world, the nation state remains the decisive instance of belonging even in a rapidly globalizing world. Uh, uh, American historian focusing on uh, European, uh, Eastern European histories have this for us. We need to understand the rise of nationalism, yes, it has its dark side, we acknowledge that, but we should not forget that it happened in tandem with people's individual needs to create a sense of belonging for themselves. To help you understand this, I want to share a picture of mine with you. What do you see here? A lot of things. <laughs> what, 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 what catches your attention the most? Sorry? <laughs> that was not my intent. <laughs> I want to see like this, this beautiful, eh? This, this beautiful vase. Do you know what art is? Yes? Ah, that is not my intent either. <laughs> but that's the beauty of art, you know, we can all come with our own perspectives. I'll come back to this point later. But for now, I want this object, this art piece, huh. ah, the vast, um, was a gift from a student of mine, uh, a grad student uh, from Iran, and I was just visiting her and her family um, in, in, in Calgary, um, and then I just saw all this amazing artwork to, from Iran. I was, for a moment, I was like, huh, how can I show my identity uh, uh, and as a Hong Konger in my home, I, go, I just cannot think of what Hong Kong art is. And then she said, oh, take this. And then I keep thinking about this. It is not just you know, a cultural symbol or one's national identity. I think to a lot of immigrants, this is actually a display of their homesickness um, and a display of the desire to keep alive the ties to their home country. And, and this is, I think, what Chad Bryan, the historic, historian, meant. It's easy to think that our oh, nationalism is just political manipulation, it's what the state wants to mobilize people with, but it's so easy to forget that nationalism would not be so attractive and so appealing if there is no such individual needs to belong to a place, something bigger, a political community. Okay, if a stranger line of freedom is not sufficient to address a fundamental need for national belonging, and then it's also dangerous, can, can, a different, a second solution would be, well, we still don't need belonging maybe. Let's just make sure everyone is included as equals in a society. 
And this solution is from the tradition we call liberal egalitarianism. If you have done political philosophy classes before, you probably recognize uh, that guy. No? No? Are you are too sick of that guy? <laughs> there, there, I think it's still the time where you, if you don't talk about John Rawls and you're not really doing political philosophy. Okay, so I'm repeating that uh, myself. And, and so uh, John Raw really uh, is an important scholar in the traditional liberal equality, uh, egalitarianism is that freedom is important, but since we are not just strangers in the society, just caught up you know, in a large room together, but as citizens, we are members. We have closer ties to one another as citizens. And, 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 and if so, how do we keep these citizen relations in good form? That is a question of ethics of membership. And to liberal egalitarians, inclusion or equal inclusion is an important ethical ideal that governs the citizen relationship. Elizabeth Anderson is another one who talks a lot about the imperative, the imperative of integration, uh, in particular for American society, where there is uh, racial uh, inequality and, and, and inequality uh, of various social statuses. Let's take a closer look at how this solution is different than the libertarian solution of just freedoms. So for liberal egalitarian, to make sure that every citizen, refugees, immigrants, members of the national uh, majority uh, are, are treated as members in a just way, not only should everyone has or everyone be guaranteed with the list of universal basic human rights, such as freedom from torture, freedom from arbitrary arrest, uh, right to humanitarian aid, right to exit, right to settle, like these are guaranteed to everyone. Libertarian says yes, liberal egalitarian says yes. The difference between the two is that for liberal egalitarian, there is a more robust set of human rights or social economic rights, guaranteed to citizens only, to members only. And this is to promote a sense of inclusion, to integrate everyone as a thriving members of the society. So these include uh, equal voting rights, equal access to public goods, such as healthcare, parks, museums, library, redistributed tax policies, also equal social status, uh, and, and in concrete policy terms that will be translated to, into anti-discrimination policies, religious accommodations, and language education. These measures should sound really familiar to you because they are usually the measures of welfare state, and Canada is one, a pretty good one by, by many standards, I would say. And, and these are only guaranteed to you as citizens. If you are just a student uh, like on a tourist visa, uh, on a student visa, if you're just a tourist, you don't get access to these. You only get access to these when you become permanent residents or citizens of Canada. And the reason that you get to enjoy these on top of these is because liberal egalitarian um, or the nation state, or the state of Canada, want to include you, integrate you as an equal member of the shared society. Okay, here are my doubts of the limits of this proposal. I think it's important, I think it's necessary to include every citizen as an equal in a society, in a shared society. But I don't think an ethics of inclusion can simply replace an ethics of belonging. So here are some interesting statistics um, from uh, Statistics Canada. What you see here is <laughs> immigrant sense of belonging across different provinces. I don't know if this surprises you or not. Uh, <laughs> so uh, 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 British Columbia and Alberta are not the, 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 the best home uh, for immigrants, apparently. Uh, Atlantic Canada and Ontario happens to be the provinces that immigrants have the strongest sense of belonging. Is this surprising? Yeah? Why? Anyone want to share quickly why? Well, I see immigrants in my Airbnb from all different provinces, and just from my experience, uh, Ontario seems to be the worst. Oh, yeah? yeah. Oh. 
so the, so, so the, the immigrants in the Airbnb, so they haven't spent a long time? Mm. Like a month or two. Okay. Like month right. Right, right. So I, I'll be interested in your thoughts later, but this is not just what I wanted to show you. Oh, okay, so people in Ontario have the highest sense of belonging and then in Alberta, not so much. That is not the most interesting finding in this survey. One is, because you may think, okay, there are various factors that may contribute to a lower sense of belonging and various factors contribute to a higher sense of belonging. But after controlling, Social democratic factors such as uh, opportunity, uh, socioeconomic opportunities, after controlling factors of perceived discrimination, after controlling all these structural factors, Ontario still has a much, or well, immigrants in Ontario still have a much higher sense of belonging than those in British Columbia. Yeah? Doesn't. It? I know. So, so actually, this survey doesn't really give us, because even the, the surveyors, the, 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 the researchers are surprised by this, and they're not sure what explains the difference. And this is my point. Success uh, of the measure of the integration underdetermined the sense of belonging. So what exactly is missing? Of course, I don't really have, oh, I know the answer. I don't know, but I have a suggestion later. Um, <laughs> um, uh, okay, just quickly about this. Um, this is another recent survey by uh, Statistics Canada. It shows that you might think the, 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 the immigrants who are most successfully integrated in Canadian society, in fact, tend to leave later. So that includes Hong Kong. That's, that's why it caught my attention. Oh, uh, immigrants from Hong Kong uh, tend to emigrate as later. Then you might think, oh, of course, it depends on, on, on the intention to, to, to move to Canada in the first place if they are just you know, investors uh, and so they're just here for the money. And so it makes sense if there is more money elsewhere and they will just move. There's nothing interesting about this finding. Well, I, 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 I think you're right. And, and, but still, it shows that Improving everyone's social economic status itself does not foster the strongest sense of belonging. So I would be very interested in hearing what you think is missing. All right. If inclusion or the ethics of inclusion is insufficient to foster a strong sense of belonging for everyone, Let's think about what belonging really requires or what is belonging and what the state can do to promote it. And now I'm moving to our third solution um, proposed by civic Republicans. Republicans, the label, I remind you of Republican in the United States, but I'm not talking about those Republicans. I'm talking about Republican like uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. So civic republicanism is a tradition in political philosophy that, got, uh, that, that, they, that traces all the way back to the Enlightenment. And, and the pioneer of this tradition is uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, he was among the very early ones who recognized that a sense of belonging among the citizens to the state is an important source of legitimacy to the political community and to the government, and is important intrinsically to the citizens themselves as well. So he does take seriously the idea of belonging, or this sense of belonging. And um, writing at the time, he already believed that more than life, beyond the tribal life, brings some social forms of alienation to us as citizens and in, in individual social beings. Um, and he believes that a political solution is needed to solve this problem of alienation. So it helps to just take a closer look at what he means by alienation and what kind of forms of social life in the modern uh, society um, damages uh, our, our sense of connection with one another. So, Rousseau's conception of alienation. It's a more political philosophy now because we're getting closer to what belonging really is. Uh, he believes that um, we have this inner nature, uh, something that longs for simplicity and peacefulness 
And we all have this innate capacity for empathy, for compassion, for peace, and for civic friendships, and love, and, and those beautiful things about relationships. And yet, modern society, modern in his days, is the feudalism, the absolute monarchy, uh, uh, engenders, however, this, this desires of selfishness and desire for competition and superiority, domination, and, and, and these alienate us from our inner nature and our capacity for empathy, connection, friendship. And in his view, the worst form of alienation is slavery. And he has a particular way to understand slavery. He says slavery takes the form of a false social contract. How, how is it a false and how is it a social contract? So this is what he means. I'm trying to dump things down a little bit because we don't have time to go deep into it. Um, but it's a very com complex idea. Um, so <clears throat> uh, to him, uh, it, it is a false social contract because it involves an artificially hierarchical relation between two parties. And one of the parties is subject to the other's arbitrary will. So whatever you desire, someone's living according to the whims of yours. And this is not alienation. This is just the hierarchical, arbitrary nature of the social contract governing two parties. And this is the, the, the consequence. The consequence of living or being governed by the false social contract is alienation. Because both parties under this false contract are driven by external motives of economic social competition and the desire for success and recognition. All right, so what is the solution? How can we escape from this false social contract? How can we escape from the worst form of alienation? According to Rousseau, democracy. Not just inclusion, not just basic human right, not just freedom, but democracy. Some form of civic participation is key to address the sense of alienation that we experience in modern society. Okay, what is the right social contract then? If the false one is a hierarchical one and arbitrary, so the right one is one that tracks the general or the sovereign will of all the citizens. Still, very technical. What do you really mean by the general will? Well, Rousseau first contrasts the, the general will with the will of all. It's not like, okay, you have a preference, you have a preference, and Kent's have a preference, let's all add it all up and then we'll see what the majority decides. No, that is just the will of all. That is just a mere aggregation of selfish interests. And to result, that is not the general will, that is not the common good, that is not the social contract on the right terms. The general will is constituted by the his, but in his word, the common good. Okay, what is the common good? Just give us the answer. The common good is to be discovered, not by him, but by everyone together, by citizen participation, and this is where democracy comes in. He doesn't really uh, give us a very clear account of how citizens should participate to discover that common good later generations of civic republicans trying to come up with their own account of how to collectively identify or author the common good. But this is an important insight from Rousseau that many neo-republican, modern day civic republicans do share, which is a political community truly belongs to its member when it is governed by a social contract collectively authored by its members. So some modern day uh, 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 Republicans uh, really believe that the current crisis of belonging or the rise of right wing populism is, uh, uh, has to be addressed by a robust uh, form uh, of direct democracy. And Christina Lafon is one of those. Uh, in her recent book, Democracy Without Shortcuts, she says this, only with, if citizens are committed to convincing one another can they continue to identify with the institutions, laws and policies to which they are subject and endorse them as their own instead of feeling alienated from them. Quickly, another short quote from another very important civic Republican, Habermasian, uh, Rhino Forrest. He says, citizens are at home when each enjoys the status of being an equal lawgiver following one's own will as well as the general will. All right, I still haven't really told you how they understand how to collectively author. 
how to collectively author the terms of a social contract. Do we just follow the traditions of one society, the religious tradition or the cultural tradition? Or do we just let the most powerful rich people decide for us what the terms of the social contract should be? No. Uh, or the majority? Majority culture, race, ethnicity? Could, could that be the common good? Thank you. <laughs> no, because that wouldn't be the will, the general will. That would just be the, 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 the dictatorial will of the few, or the tyranny of the majority. Okay. If that is not the way to collectively author or decide or endorse the terms of a social contract, so what civic Republicans propose that we need an ethics of deliberation. There are gonna be differences between you and me. Mm. You and me have very different beliefs, uh, 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 um, political ones, social and cultural, religious ones, very different, and we're gonna disagree on a lot of things. Uh, we can't just flip a coin, so what can we do about this terms of the contract? So we need to deliberate, deliberate rationally, respectfully, and that's an, what an ethics of deliberation is. And I believe that Professor Dillman is a better expert on this than I am. You should ask her what's best. But this is just a very a, a, a short account of it. I hope that is still fair. Um, so since the social contract is taken by the civic Republicans to be the source of political belonging, the greater democratic control over the construction of the social contract, the stronger the sense of belonging among its members. Under the conditions of diversity and conflict, the terms of social contract cannot just be found, but it, they have to be debated and negotiated among all members. So this is how debate is so crucial to democracy, especially to civic republicans. But not just any debate can help us find the right terms. That is agreeable to everyone. If someone has unaccountable power, if some of them are biased, if some of them just have more political clout and they can manipulate one another, they can misrepresent and just, you know, like uh, the important uh, student presentations did about just, just misinform the public through, you know, on their platforms or, or control over social media, then the result of that debate and negotiation would not be fair and would not be just and would not be true and would not be reliable. And so, any ethics, ethical deliberation or democratic deliberation should at least aspire to some of these. They are aspirational ideals. It's where that any society can live up to all these ideals, and this is not even the exhaustive list of the ideals that should govern the civil debates, but these are very common ideals and norms that should govern the integrity of the process of the debate, such as everyone should be participating as equals, we should include as many people as possible, and we should all aim at truth, and we should be rational instead of irrational, just following the norms, conforming to biases. No, that's not rational. And we should be reciprocal. We should, uh, we should respect one another. We should be fair. I should not just uh, shut you up because I happen to be louder than you are. Um, and, and we should be sincere. If you counter me with arguments that is a good one, then I should open my mind up to change my existing belief. I should not just hold on to my belief because, ah, that's my belief. That is, that's not sincere as a debater, as a member of the democratic society. Yeah, difficult to be a good member, eh? <laughs> the, the question though for me is, it's not just whether it's feasible uh, or not. Of course, feasibility is an important concern for deliberative democracy. But for me, and for the topic today, is, is deliberative democracy really a good solution or effective one to the crisis of belonging? Do you really think that if everyone is included as equal and sincere enough and rational enough and given all sorts of right information and then they participate in civil debate, do you think that this process can really foster a sense of belonging? Any political scientists here? I don't think I've seen <laughs> a survey on this, so it would be very interested to test it. So I, it's, it's still an open question but because it has never been truly realized. It has all realized in, in small scale, like, like, like a town meeting. The town meeting, of course, is not a democratic community. 
So that's an open question, but, but I have my own doubt. I really believe that the civic Republicans, at least following from Rousseau, uh, misunderstand what belonging is. Think about a place a lot of people find a sense of belonging. They feel grounded. Like religious belonging, I think, is a paradigm case. I, I don't think the best way to understand the relation between religious followers and the church uh, is one of social contract, nor do I think that mem members have democratic control over the religious text. They don't author it. But churches, or at least a lot of religions, remain an important place of belonging for their followers. So it doesn't seem that control plays a crucial role. Ah. I, I, I come here just to show this. Have you seen the movie, Past Lives? Yes, love it. How many? Okay, quite a few, quite a few. You have to see it. I, I, I will try not to spoil too much. Uh, <laughs> so, I don't, for those who have seen it, I'll, 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 I'll restrain myself. I love this movie so much, I, I watched it twice already. At the end of the, of the movie, okay, it's just quickly about the plot, mm, without too much spoilers. <laughs> It, it, yeah, yeah. So um, the protagonist, oops, the protagonist uh, moved from Seoul, South Korea, with parents to Toronto when she was about 12 years old, leaving her childhood sweetheart. Um, and then 12 years later, they reconnected over Facebook, but only on Facebook. But it's too painful to have long distance relationship. If you haven't tried, don't. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so 12 years later, uh, that protagonist already met uh, her, her, her husband, uh, uh, American, in a writing resort, a retreat, and, 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 and somehow they reconnected again. Uh, uh, the childhood sweetheart grew up, spent his life in Seoul, uh, visited her in New York. So that is 24 years later. And so this is the background of the movie. I think it's the best movie that articulates the, the sorrow of immigration and displacement. At the end of the movie, there is a crying scene and there is no words whatsoever. And my question is, why is it so painful? Why was she crying when they said goodbye, when, uh, the, when, when the guy decided to, okay, to go back? to Seoul and she stays with her loving husband in New York. Is it because she losing, she's losing control over herself or the current marriage or the, or, the, or, the, or the relationship that she used to have with this childhood sweetheart? I really don't think the control or, or, or not having debates between them is the reason that they, she feels sad. I'm gonna come back to this later if I have time. Um, but this is just to prompt some intuitions that you might have about what belonging really is. And it's not so much about controlling the terms of the relationship and having your say in a relationship. And I believe, and I try to convince you to reconceptualize belonging as bond of history. And this is gonna be the final part of the presentation tonight. Um, so this is a fairly new conception. Uh, belonging itself is just under theorized in political philosophy. Um, but one of my favorite Israeli philosopher, uh, Avijay Margalit, uh, has written a re 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 recent book on, on belonging and betrayal. And I quite like his definition or account of belonging, although it's under notice. He says um, belonging is a bond and it's it's a sort of mutual recognition of the members involved of their specialness and irreplaceability in each other's life. More importantly, this sense of specialness and irreplaceability is not grounded in merits or shared interest or shared values. Um, rather, it's grounded in the historical depth or the historical consciousness of the relationship. To help you make sense of this, if you are in a relationship, say, 
if your parents only judge you for how well you perform in school, uh, whether you get a good job, you might feel like, oh, mom, that, 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 that seems to alienate me from you a little bit because it's my worth to you as you know, a daughter or a son uh, uh, in this family grounded just on my merits. Um, nor is it just about shared interests or shared values because we know these things are contingent features of ourselves. Our interests and our value shifts and yours happen to shift as well. And if what grounds us, what, 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 what binds us together are these contingent features, then you might change and I might change and we might just dissolve at any moment. And that is not secure enough. History, on the other hand, can be different and it's harder to just destroy it. I'll, I'll say a little bit more about the depth of history later. But according to this conception of belonging, home is a non-judgmental relationship. It accepts us as we are for the meaningful role that we have played in this relationship and will continue to play. And the deeper the history, the stronger the sense of being at home we feel and the more secure we feel in this home. The next question would be, okay, if deeper the history, the stronger the bond, how can we deepen the history? Mm. It's not through debate, at least not alone. Uh, I argue it's through narrating artful stories of the relationship and in the political sense, it's gonna be narrating artful stories of the peoplehood for the political community as a whole. Question then is, what is the narrative? What does narration really mean? Well, minimally speaking, every narrative has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So it's not just a chronicle. It's not just representing all the events and facts that happened in the past. No, no, that, that, it's not just a linear representation. It has a beginning, middle, and an end. And it's also not just a scientific narrative. It's not just a practice of science where, where the narrative or the narration is governed by norms of truth, uh, coherence, and intelligibility. Reading a historical textbook, reading academic professional scientific history itself doesn't give us a sense of subjectivity or doesn't give rise to historic consciousness. Uh, you can read history of all the countries, but you might not necessarily feel that you belong to those countries or those civilizations. So what I believe is also needed to tell a, a story that, that can deepen the history is that it be an aesthetic practice. It gotta be governed by norms of beauty, resonance, and inspiration. Some of the techniques, I, if you're interested, we can go into details later, but to, to tell awful histories, to tell awful stories, oftentimes, instead of just recounting the events and the people involved in the past, you also need to plot it. You give an arc of history. The arc of history can be one of tragedy, so it, it goes start from here and then it fall. It can be triumph, so it starts here and it rises. It can be one of irony, it can be one of resurgence, it can be one of trial, uh, uh, reconciliation. And it's not just about plotting an arc of the events of history, it's also about character building. If you are into movie making, you know that this is so crucial, or playwriting, it's so crucial to, to build resonating character. Um, in the past, it would be victim and heroes, and now we understand those are very, uh, uh, that those might not resonate or be easily identifiable with the audience, and then you also need villains or anti-heroes and lots of options. Okay. So this is how I understand belonging. Um, belonging is not just about wielding control over terms of a social contract or asserting sovereignty over a place, rather it's about having and being seen to have a meaningful role in an ongoing historical narrative. And I do believe this conception of belonging can better explain the ongoing crisis of belonging for both the immigrants and the majority. On my definition, displacement or alienation 
It's not about losing control over the democratic process, at least not just that. I feel displaced or estranged from my community when maybe my role, my historical role is being distorted or erased from the meaningful story. Alternatively, or also that my political community has no meaningful story to tell. I somehow politically, we, we don't get to tell our story. Or the worth of my membership in this political community is just solely on the basis of my merits or demerits or the interests and values that I happen to share or don't share with other members. Bear this in mind. Um, about not, about the role being erased, about my community not being able to tell a meaningful story anymore. I think it resonates deeply with the real life story of a refugee and also a Russian um, literary. Uh, so Tevi is a humorist, is a memoirist, and in her recently translated memoir, uh, Memories from Moscow to Black Sea, she was escaping the Bolshevik. Bolshevik. And, and then she, she wrote about her, her journey from uh, escaping uh, Moscow. And this is one of the most beautiful quotes from this book. And I hope to share that with you to just to illuminate the pain of displacement and estrangement. And it's all about the bond of history. There are moments when threats snap. All these threats that tie what is earthly in the soul to the earth itself. Your nearest and dearest become in infinitely distant, barely even the memory. Even the events in your past that once matter most to you grow dim. All the huge and important thing we call life fades away, and you become that primordial nothing out of which the universe was created. So it was on that night, the black, empty, round earth, and the boundless, starry sky. I'm not gonna ruin this for you. You have to watch it for yourself. And I do believe that the joy of the movie when she reunited with her childhood sweetheart was finally someone to share the old memories of soul with. Not soul, South Korea soul, but maybe soul here too. Um, and the cry and the weeping at the end of the movie, I argue, as a philosopher, <laughs> um, um, is that no one can honor the shared memories of soul anymore. And the, some, the identity, the belonging that the protagonists have for soul dissolve all over again. She is being exiled from the memory of the community. That is what is so sad about being an immigrant or refugee or being an exiled. What about the majority? You might, okay, that makes sense of refugee immigrant experience. What about the majority who said that they feel like they are strangers in their own country? I think there is something to be said about that as well. I also think that they are somewhat disoriented in history. Gordon Brown, Labour, progressive left in the UK, once says this to the people, to, to the British people. Is that, ah. I hear people say we have to stop and debate globalization. You might as well debate whether autumn should follow summer. The character of this changing world is indifferent to tradition. Unforgiving of frailty, no respecter of past reputation, it has no custom and practice, they replete with opportunities, but they go only with those swift to adapt, slow to complain, open, willing, and able to change. That, I believe, characterizes a lot of the attitude of the progressive left to history. Well, yeah, there is history, but we don't have to reconcile with it. It's a globalized world. We need to adapt. We have to change. Who cares about history? And yet, there are people like Trump. Uh, uh, there are the far-right populists, the demagogues, who understand, I think, better uh, human need for national belonging. And they give them a sense of history. They tell stories, maybe artful but not ethical, uh, stories about the nation that they share and give them meaningful roles. They are heroes who protect the America that was once great. And these are the heroes of the country who can make America great again. They give them meaningful role, they tell a particular story of America and it makes it so resonating, inspiring for those who believe in it. So this is the conundrum that we're in. That's why I think the left and the right need to 
don't give us a good solution to the crisis of belonging. The left says, okay, who cares about reconciling with history? Uh, the right says, well, any change dishonors history, so we cannot change. We are stuck in the past. But I want to convince us, those who care about belonging, those who care about the health of liberal democracy, maybe there is a better solution, there is a third way out. Maybe we can try to learn to confer meanings to changes in ways that honor the death and bond of history. How, how am I doing on time? Ah, yeah, okay, I'll take seven more minutes of your attention, and then I really want to hear what your thoughts are on, because, uh, yeah. We're not going to kick us out, so. Mm? Nobody's going to kick us out, so. Oh, okay, perfect, perfect. So, if it is true that we need to learn to confer meaning to changes that honor the bond and the death of history, then I believe what we need for this crisis of belonging is an ethics of belonging and an ethics of narration. To put it differently, an ethics of belonging, one that's inclusive and just and not oppressive, requires an ethics of narration. That is to say, no, I am not <laughs> suggesting, we'll just go back to myth. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've been labeled uh, different ways. Some people call me conservative, and other people say I'm a Leninist Marxist, whatever. But for today's purpose, I'm not just saying that, well, we should go to pre-enlightenment time, or we'll just tell myths, and then everything will be good again. No, that's not what I'm suggesting. Um, but I do believe stories are necessary, but not just artful story. We need artful and ethical stories. And it's not clear that because stories, or because in analytic or, or, or Western political philosophy, there is this uh, uh, rationalist tendency, we, we tend to believe that stories are always distorting of uh, experience or reality, and, 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 and we just don't really have a robust or developed uh, accounts of ethics of narration. It's either myth or principles, myths or facts, myths or science, but we got to find a way to confer meaning, to change our temporal experience in this world. And I believe these are the three core normative challenges or three core normative risks that we should address and overcome in an adequate ethical account of narration. The first one is there is this risk of fanaticism when telling stories. What do I mean by that? As if you can recall, if you, you are still with me, earlier I said uh, we need to tell artful story, we need to plot, we need to find arcs of history, triumphs, resurgence, rec reconciliation. All those plotting should raise your eyebrows because plotting is, an, is, is, is a device, is a medium, is, is a, a practice of aesthetics. Trump is doing that too. He is plotting the story of Make America Great Again as one of resurgence. So it's not just plotting. And there is something I do think dangerous about plotting and, and, and aesthetic, as well put by Oscar Wilde, although he doesn't he intend this way, he says, lying, the telling of beautiful untruth thing is the proper aim of art. So this idea is that uh, maybe there is, a st there is tension between art and truth. There is tension between beauty and truth. Now, I cannot address this. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. But I do think there is tension, of, about tell, uh, with tension between telling beautiful stories and, and telling true stories. And in part because beauty doesn't seem to always aspire to truth, or truth doesn't always aspire to beauty. Um, more relevant to our political context, uh, political theorist Ernest Renan says this, forgetting, and I would even say historical era, are an essential factor in the creation of a nation. And so it is that progress in historical studies is often a dangerous to nationality. If you take it the wrong way, it's like, oh no, we should not study scientific history, we should not study history, but we should just study myths, and because myths are all that we need to create a sense of nationhood, a peoplehood. I, I don't think that's the best way. I, I think we really need to get beyond this dichotomy between myth and, and fact or, or fictions and, and, and historical truth. Um, I think the meaning of lived story, meaning of historical 
narrative should not model that of literary fiction. Um, it should be constrained by its truth, however you understand truth to be. Uh, to put it more concretely, this is what I have in mind as a work in progress. I believe that lie is unacceptable in an ethical account of narration. So you, if you want to tell a meaningful, awful story uh, of Canada, you cannot lie and you uh, cannot lie about cultural genocide, um, saying that it didn't happen. You cannot omit that even. Now you cannot just, oh, when we tell the history of Canada, we cannot just omit the fact that there was a set of colonization, there is colonial violence that happened. You cannot omit that. However, I would entertain this, you can persuade me otherwise easily, that, but maybe it's okay to do a little bit of embellishment to tell a, a story of Canada. Maybe you could focus on the moment of remorse, of guilt, and when you tell the story of a reconciliation, you can highlight these facts, but you cannot lie, you cannot omit the facts, because those are essential to who we are today. But maybe you can selectively focus on moments that can honor the depth and the bond of history. Another risk of historical narration, especially awful narration, is um, uh, or, his, or any form of narration is conservatism. Because you always look back to the past and, and I do believe a lot of conservative leaders uh, in, in different uh, political parties, they just want to reproduce the past, telling origin story and return modern society, one that's globalized society, back to where they were, one that is sinophobic, one that's uh, uh, monolithic. And I don't believe that is ethical to do. Um, I do believe that the ethics of narration should be aspire to open-endedness, and in part because that is just the logic of history. The end is always partial and is always open, and we should recognize the fact that it's just the logic of history. And a good narrator of history is one who actively looks for missed evidence, correct the old and mistaken interpretations, and bring to light new possible readings of the story and through which opening up new understanding of who we are and who we can be. Because historical narration is not representation of the past, it's interpretation of the past and that opens up new fields of possibility for us. And interpretations is, can always change when there is new evidence that come to light. <clears throat> Do you know Beach House? It's an indie band. <laughs> whose music I love a lot. And there is a song called Myth. It's about how we need myth, but also the dangers of myth. There is a, sent there is a line in the lyrics of the, the song Myth that I like a lot. And it says, an in-between is never as it seems. I think that is the challenge for narrator and for good political historical narrators, is always to look what's in-between it's never as it seems. So finally, I th think that the, uh, the, the third most uh, important normative risk of narration is the risk of oppression. We have to recognize that there is this lure of telling totalizing or simple narratives like the Nazi myth, the Nazi narrative is totalizing. Uh, it doesn't tolerate any nuances and contradictions in interpretation of who they are or what history is. There is no incoherence. And some people argue that conspiracy theories on Nazi myth, they are, uh, they, they are so appealing and powerful in part because they are beautiful to some people. Uh, there, there is beauty in, in, in unity, in simplicity, and in, in the unifying feature of it. Um, I think we do need to recognize this fact and this danger, and, and, and what we should do is to tell competing stories, one that is, can hold space for nuances and, and, and ambiguities. So one way is to focus on individual solution, we should all refine our aesthetic taste, but I don't think that's the best political solution. I think for to, a political solution should be institutional. We should look for institutions in democracy that entrench the norms of 
multiplicity in our interpretation and also institutionalize opportunities for various narrators, maybe political parties, different political leaders, uh, to, to tell different narratives, stories of their shared history and to make sure that everyone gets the equal chance to contest each other's versions, and not just for now, but in an ongoing manner. So I do believe that liberal democracy and electoral politics has some resources for political parties, for political narrators to do such thing, and, and that if you're interested in, 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 in the institutional uh, dimension of ethics of narration, I, I, I'm very happy to talk uh, with you during the Q&A, but i like to quickly conclude because I know I, I've asked too much of your attention. If you forget all the details, uh, the pictures, the scenes from past life, that's okay. <laughs> but remember the four solutions that we have looked at today. I, I hope that uh, you know that libertarians suggest that we can simply recognize one another as strangers and we can live in this land of freedom is insufficient because we have this deep need for national belonging. And I also hope that you can remember the, libertarian egalitarian, the liberal egalitarian solution of ethics of inclusion may be necessary but not sufficient for fostering a strong sense of belonging. Um, while the civic republicans argue that belonging is important, I think they have misunderstood what belonging really is. They focus so much on control or democratic control over the social contract, which they think it binds us together. I don't think that social contract is the cement of society, nor do I think that control, uh, belonging is primarily about control. My conclusion or my proposal is that what binds us together is our sheer historical depth and sheer consciousness. And in order to nourish this historical consciousness and depth in an ethical way, we need an ethics of narration. Thank you very much. <laughs>